today we're going to talk about how I discovered the truth about hormonal contraceptives and how that journey became a gateway drug, pun intended, that led me into the Catholic Church. Hi, I'm Samantha Stevenson, Catholic author, podcast host, and homeschooling mother of four. The only person who ever warned me about the dangers of hormonal contraceptives was my eighth grade religion teacher. I started using the birth control patch when I was about 13 years old for intense, debilitating menstrual pain. My mother thought it was a great idea. My doctor thought it was a great idea. No one warned me that there might be any danger in these medications except my Catholic school religion teacher. And I assumed that she was just biased because of her religious beliefs. So I found it really ironic when about 10 years later, I became that religion teacher warning my own teenage students of the risks of hormonal birth control. Luckily, I had personal experience and horrifying photos to back up my claims, but we'll get to that later. So I was raised in the Lutheran church and my family was fairly devoted and pretty active. My dad played guitar in the worship band, went to youth group. And so when I went to uh, my Catholic high school, I was always ready to debate the truth with anyone who would engage, but found few takers. It was a small high school. So at this point, my experience with birth control was that I was taking it mostly because that's what you do for female complaints. Most OBs, that's all they have to offer. No searching for the root causes of these issues. Just cover them up with the pill. And I will say, I think this is an unintended consequence for uh, many teenage users of the pill who begin taking it just for pain or just to regulate cycles. But being on the pill made it that much easier for me to lose my virginity as a senior in high school. Why not? You're, you're already prepared. You're being safe. In my own religious formation growing up, I knew sex before marriage wasn't okay, but I didn't know why. I was just never exposed to any reasoning of why that would be important other than this is what God says, so don't do it. And I had a grand dream. I was going to marry this boy. I thought all the foolish, naive things that young women think when they get caught up in when it's your first real romance. So needless to say, I had a rude awakening when I learned the true nature of teenage boys. And this boy was not heartless or cruel by any means, but he was just a boy. And I was so broken by this experience this fracturing of my trust and my body. I had given over to this boy with thoughts of forever. And I mean, literally, we know that at the hormonal level, that rush of oxytocin that's released during sexual intercourse, that's meant to bond you. It's meant to steal you together. Sex is a, a beautiful gift from God to aid the unity of the partners in marriage. It's designed to bond you. I was so broken by this rupture. But at the same time, I'm actually really thankful for that pain because it woke me up. I realized this, this is the why of abstaining from premarital sex. This is what God's laws were meant to shield me from all along and to direct me towards a real man who's going to be there for me in sickness and in health and to death do us part. I vowed that I was going to practice chastity in my dating relationships. During my freshman year of college, I started dating a good Catholic boy who explained to me the church's teachings on hormonal birth control. He actually, at one point, he had been on a chastity show on EWTN. So had a uh, very different perspective than I had had as a teenager. But he was just, he was such a blessing to me because he knew about my past. But as passionate as he was for the church's teachings on chastity, he was really able to show me the face of God's mercy and bring it home for me in a tangible way that I was not my sin, 
that I had been forgiven, that I was just as desirable as if I had never made those poor choices because I had been made new in Christ. As a Protestant, actually, I found it fairly easy to accept his arguments that if we are to have faith in God about everything, that faith should include our fertility. And I know that's not the way for, for all Protestants, not the way for all Catholics, not the way for most people. Um, but for me, that was pretty simple. And I just accepted that and resolved that once I married, I would stop using the birth control pill. And so then I started to wonder and become more curious about the rest of the Catholic Church's teaching. And I began singing it in the choir and attending mass regularly, singing in the choir. I went to Axel T. Adoration and RCIA classes at my university. Unfortunately, the RCIA classes were pretty poor, and I concluded there wasn't really much substance to the Catholic faith. And you can tell how poor they were from that conclusion. A few months later, I had broken up with that Catholic boy, and I still had lingering thoughts about becoming Catholic. It just seemed to me like there was so much more to being Catholic. It wasn't merely part of our identity, but really this framework for understanding the entire purpose of our existence. So I, I fell into a group of really zealous, life team formed campus ministry students. They wore t-shirts that said things like, the cafeteria is closed. And Joseph Ratzinger, fan club, you know, they, they knew their faith and they loved it. So one day, one of these students takes me to the cafeteria, sits me down, the Bible in one hand. He says, okay, what are your objections? And for three hours, he talked me through the biblical citations for every objection I had to Catholic doctrine. Then he took me to the library, pulling books off the shelves, helped for me in my intellectual understanding of the Catholic faith. At the time, I didn't know this, but he ended up going back to his roommate and he said, I just met the girl you're going to marry. And he ended up telling that story in his best man's beach at our wedding. Anyway, what finally sealed the deal for me was actually reading Realm Sweet Home by Scott Hahn and his wife, Kimberly. She told her story about contraceptives. Her husband told his story of converting from his life as a Protestant minister. In their words, just they really resonated with me. And their objections were my objections. Their answers really quelled the fire that had been lit inside of me that was searching for the truth. And at that point, I would say that sealed the deal on my intellectual conversion. And once my mind was convicted, my faith followed through prayer. And I found immense healing through the Divine Mercy Chaplet, daily adoration, reading the book Redeeming Love by Francine Rivers that was recommended to me by a priest. I found a better RCIA program. I changed my major to theology, so I ended up actually having a degree in theology with minors in psychology and philosophy, and I would later go on to get actually my master's degree in uh, both theology and bioethics. I was received into the church on April 26, 2000, and when I became Catholic, I had ceased to use birth control pills. You know, it had been fine to take to my bed in pain once a month because I was a pretty good student. I could catch up if I was just missing classes. But I knew that once I graduated, that was not going to fly in the workplace. So I actually started up the birth control pills again. And uh, I actually uh, ended up missing my first day of work, leaving a message saying, sorry, I can't make it. I'm on my way to the ER. When I had woken up that morning, my left leg from hip to ankle was purple. So I called my mom because what do you do when you wake up when your leg is purple? You call your mom. She incidentally had just had a blood clot due to her use of hormonal birth control. And she said, no, that doesn't sound like her experience. She just had a little bit of swelling and some redness. In the half hour that we talked, my leg swollen to four times its size. I literally, I barely made it down the three flights of my stairs from my apartment to get to my car, but I had no choice because it was not a fancy apartment. There was no elevator. So if I had to get to the hospital, I had to get down the stairs. As it turns out, I am one of many women 
who have a genetic condition that predisposes us to blood clots. There's this gene that gets turned on by the presence of the hormones in birth control. And so this is one of the rare side effects of the hormones in birth control. And no doctor that I ever saw, and I had seen one after the other at this point to solve this pain that I experienced, but none of them had ever thought to disclose this as a risk to me. None of them had ever tested me for a genetic condition or asked about genetic history for blood clotting conditions. Comedian Jen Bullweiler, actually, she has a similar condition. Haley Bieber had a stroke from a clot that went to her brain after starting the pill. So, praise God, that did not happen. I did not go to my brain. I did not have a stroke. It did not go to my heart. I did not have a heart attack. Uh, in an article for the Today Show, actually, Bieber lists primary causes contributing to her stroke. And so I just want you to listen to this. I had just recently started birth control pills, which I should never have been on because I'm somebody who suffered from migraines anyway. I just did not talk to my doctor about this. Okay, so isn't that just so interesting? Uh, I'm wondering how many women out there are on hormonal birth control or who have ever been prescribed hormonal birth control. Were you, did your doctor ever ask you if you had migraines when they prescribed the pill to you? Because no doctor ever asked me at 13 if I had migraines. And yet somehow that's this marker that if you have migraines, you have headaches, you, you might have a, a stroke from this. Uh, medication and and you might uh, you might die from that, but I find it really interesting that she she says it like that. I just I did not talk to my doctor about this. She literally ended up with a clot damaging her brain, and somehow that's her fault. Oh, I just I didn't disclose the right information to my doctor. Therefore, somehow it's acceptable that I was prescribed these drugs that gave me brain damage and could have killed me. Why, why are we thinking about these medications like that? How do we get to the point where somebody prescribes you something that causes a stroke and you think, oh, well, it must have been my fault. In 2011, actually, law student Erica Langhart did die from her youth of maneuvering. These are not isolated cases by any means. We're supposed to buy the line that these side effects are rare. Actually, no. The history of birth control is a history of damaging women. It is absolutely scandalous how many Puerto Rican women died in early cl clinical trials of these drugs, but they kept going. Clinical trials of male contraceptives have failed because too many participants drop out due to side effects like headache, acne, low sex drive, Women, this is so important. It's okay if you die for this. Men, headache, little blemish, I'm out. If you look at the numbers, over 1 million American women are suffering today. So that's not just, that's not the whole world, that's just the United States. From one or more serious medical conditions as a result of their use of hormonal birth control. When I think of numbers, I don't know about you, but one million is not does not sound rare to me. Certainly not rare enough that these risks are not disclosed. So let me just read some of them to you. Breast cancer, blood clot, and other cardiovascular risks, cervical cancer, osteoporosis, autoimmune diseases, female sexual dysfunction, depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders, and even suicide. In particular, the Depo-Provera birth control shot is known to increase a woman's risk of contracting human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, the virus that causes acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS. Okay, if that's unacceptable to you and you want to do something to move the needle, the organization Natural Womanhood, which is where this list is from, is petitioning the FDA to mandate accountability for these pharmaceutical companies. If you want to include your signature, you can head over to their website. I will link it in the show notes, and you can also head over there to see this data for yourself. But I digress. Why was I on my way 
to the emergency room. Well, I was suffering a life-threatening DVT. So whereas my mother, what she was describing, she had experienced a superficial clot, right? Little blood, little swelling. I mean, little redness, little swelling. I had a deep vein thrombosis. So my entire vein from my hip to my ankle was completely clotted. All the blood was flowing in. None of it was flowing out. So I ended up undergoing several surgeries and anticoagulation therapy for months to correct this injury. A year, I'm going to say a year after that, I was engaged um, and I began monitoring my cycle in preparation for marriage. And we used a natural family planning method called Creighton. It has a medical component to it called NAPRO or natural reproductive technology. So get this. 13 years old. At this point, I'm getting engaged. I was, I was 23. So for 10 years, I had been going to doctors and pill, 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 pill. Oh, now we discover you can't take the pill because they kill you. Um, so what are you going to do for your pain? They prescribe me narcotics. Uh, but after just a few cycles with uh, my NAPRO doctor, she was able to diagnose the problem, the, the underlying cause of my period pain by looking at glancing at my Creighton chart. I have endometriosis. And she could tell that by looking at the signs from my cycle. And so I quickly had a laparoscopy to fix the condition. Still have pain, but I have never been unable to cope. Dependent on narcotics or any of the other challenges I faced from the time I was a teen for 10 years, seeing doctor after doctor. And, and actually, since switching to the paleo diet, so my autoimmune condition, my pain from my endometriosis is uh, down to almost zero. And, you know, I have actually always wondered why women experience such a high rate of autoimmunity and particularly Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, which is what I have. I'm not a doctor. This is my life. This is not medical advice. Um, but I do wonder, since autoimmunity is caused partly by the abundance of toxins in our environment, I do wonder if the standard of care for all OB complaints is to pump a generation of women full of these chemicals that they don't need that are actually classified by the WHO as class one carcinogens. I do wonder if that might account for the drastically increased rate of women affected when compared to men with these autoimmune disorders. And actually looking at the data from natural womanhood, it appears that there is evidence to suggest that these are real harms. And the FDA needs to be doing much more to inform women and the medical establishment of the stunning level of risk women are being subjected to without informed consent, without their knowledge. And even in the midst of all of that, I have so much hope going forward for this generation of women. This is a generation of women ready to say no to the establishment ready to say no to big pharma, no to a culture that tells them to give their bodies up for love, not even for love, for cheap imitation love. It's completely counterfeit. Uh, they are really waking up to the poisonous effects of birth control in our bodies, or in our society. Brett Cooper and Candace Owens recently put something out about this. I have Protestant friends who are begging their friends to look into this. My friend Rachel over at the To Grow Good podcast, which is an awesome podcast of conversion stories, she had her own conversion, waking up to the truth of contraception. And when people get to that point, when they are ready to dig deeper, they start asking, who's been warning us about this all along? Who has been the only consistent source of opposition to contraception since its invention? And it leads them to the church. It leads them to Jesus, if they didn't already know him. Or if they did, like me, it leads them to the truth of the church Jesus founded and in deeper communion with him and deeper understanding of our purpose. Ultimately, what I discovered in the church was her wisdom. She is not punitive. When she says no to these practices, it is not to keep something good away from us. That was the original lie of the garden, that God is withholding something good from us. When we refer to the church as our mother, like any good mother, she wants what's best for us. So whether it's premarital sex, contraception, or IVF and surrogacy, she's not holding out on us when she says no. 
These guidelines are to free us for a good that is better than anything we would have imagined for ourselves. So that is what I do now. That's why I wrote the book, Reclaiming Motherhood from a Culture Gone Mad, and share on this podcast, Brave New Us, and through my Substock newsletter, to wake people up to the dystopia we are creating by allowing the proliferation of these technologies that are changing and shifting our human future. If you want to be a part of that, if you want to help me and our team make this happen, you can, of course, subscribe to the podcast everywhere on YouTube. You can join the email newsletter for exclusive content at faithandbioethics.com. Whether it is by offering your financial support or just raising awareness of these issues, if you feel called to act on these issues, we would love to be just one of the many ways that God is using you to bless his kingdom. Thank you and God bless.